Okay, good evening everybody. Good evening, it's great to see you. Thank you very much for coming. Some of you from very far away, I, I understand. I just want to run a quick survey, see how far we've come from. Who's traveled less than 50 miles? Less than 50, oh, okay, that's great, that's a majority. 50 miles, 50 miles-ish, okay. And how about 100? 100, yes, okay, well, big hand to these guys. Okay, well done. <laughs> thank you very much, thank you very much. Um, well, I, um, it's good to be invited again. Uh, last time I was here, I talked about the subject of creation evolution, and um, it was um, talking about what are the possibilities that evolution could be true. We took you through all the meanings of evolution, and um, it's great to be invited back again um, to, to talk about how old is the earth. Now, we, I'm going to talk about how old is the earth today. Now, is it billions, is it millions, or is it thousands? What does the Bible say? We're going to look at what the Bible says. We're going to look at, well, does the Bible conflict with science? And we're going to also look at, does evolution conflict with science? So we're going to look at that. But first of all, what I'm going to do is, the first half of my talk, I'm going to cover what does the Bible say the earth is, or the world is, how old is the world? And then we're going to cover scientifically what from science we know that says the, the world is the world young or is the world old. So we're going to take you through that. But first of all, I'm going to remind you a little bit of my background. I'm John Harris. I'm, I'm Lebanese. I'm, I've come all the way from Lebanon, obviously, especially for this occasion. Um, I'm a managing director of a company. I've been a managing director now for the last 15 years. Um, I technically sort of specialize in computer software design and development. I design systems in half a dozen languages. So I've been in this business for quite a long time. Um, as, as I said earlier, it was exactly a year ago when I did my talk, and um, it's quite exciting to come back and talk about this again. I've spent thousands of hours in this subject over the last few years. It's been, um, I've de dedicated a lot of my time into debates and talks, and the more debates and talks I do, I find myself being more and more attacked on the internet and emails and so on. Well, you see, Apparently what these guys don't know are attacking me, that uh, I've been brought up in sort of severe war conditions. Uh, when I was young, between 7 and 17, I had to dodge bombs, guns, snipers, daily, sometimes hourly, day and night. It was a sort of a rough upbringing. And so when somebody attacks you and, and he says sort of unpolite words, it's sort of a park, in the, a, a ride in the park, really. My education was mostly... <laughs> my education was mostly uh, in Lebanon. I came here to finish my computer uh, studies, and um, I was particularly good at certain subjects. Uh, I was good at uh, physics, chemistry, with geology, biology, and particularly astronomy. I was very rubbish at everything else. Um, <laughs> I finished my computer studies here in England. Uh, I was so good at astronomy that my teacher felt uh, obliged to take me aside and give me personal sort of education, lecturing about evolution, the theory of evolution. Uh, it was very nice of him. I'm very grateful to him. Uh, <laughs> well, this is what the Big Bang theory looks like in Arabic. This is my handwriting. So if you can't read that, don't worry. I've got a terrible handwriting. Um, <laughs> And generally, in Lebanon, you're not taught the evolution theory aggressively. Generally, if you go to somebody and you tell them that your ancestors came from an ape-like creature, generally they take that as an insult and they shoot you. So they don't actually do that a lot. Here I've noticed in this country, if you go to somebody and you tell them that our ancestors came from an ape-like creature, you graduate and get a degree. <laughs> Quite a difference there. Okay, let's go back, let's go back to uh, what the uh, subject at hand is. How old is the earth? Now, I'm going to run a quick survey here because I want to compare you with the surveys that they've done out there. First of all, I'm going to ask you a simple question. If you believe that God created the world, raise your hand, just so that I see. Okay, fantastic, hands down. Now, tougher question. If you believe that, that God created everything within the last 6,000, and some say to 10,000, I'm okay with that, between six and 10,000 years uh, ago, then raise your hand now. Okay, that's fantastic. Well, in case you're interested, they've done a survey conducted in Britain in 2006, 
and they said, over t this is for over 2,000 people who took part in this survey, they were asked what best described their view of the origin of development of life, and only 22% chose creationism. These are, uh, that means humans who were created within the last 10,000 years. What actually hit the headlines was not that 22% of people chose creationism. What hit the headlines was the fact that only half, less than half chose evolution. That is what hit the headline, which I thought was remarkable. They repeated the survey three years later, and this is what they came up with. They published it in 2009. It showed, that, it showed those who believed that created everything in the last 10,000 years reduced from 22% to 17%. But this is what's really interesting about this survey. The charts will show you how convinced each group are of their own beliefs. Okay, so their beliefs are definitely true. Do they believe that what they, their theory is probably true, definitely untrue, or probably untrue? Well, look at how convinced the young earth creationists are of their own theory. Here are the results. 38% say that it is probably untrue and only 11% say it's definitely true. So those people who believe in creationism are actually not very convinced themselves that, um, of their own theory, which is a pretty sad state to be in. Okay. All right. Well, it seems like as times go by, less and less people believe in a young earth. It wasn't always like that. Less than 250 years ago, the dominant view was that the earth was, old, was as old as the Bible said. So it was young around about 6,000 years ago. Okay, things have changed. They believed, in those days, they believed that the Noah's flood was a worldwide catastrophe and that it's responsible for the fossils, the earth layers, and the carving of canyons like great, uh, the Grand Canyon. The age of the earth, believe it or not, is an extremely important subject. I can't imagine something more important than this. You see, it's important to creationists because it needs to match what the Bible says because if the world is not as old as the Bible says, then God's word is at stake here, isn't it? God's authority, reliability is at stake. Well, evolutionists need it to be old because something else is at stake. They need time to evolve. Do you see what I'm saying? So the question of evolution is very important to both parties. If you're a creation, it needs to match the Bible. And if you're an evolutionist, it needs to be old so that you've got time to evolve. But if the world is young, then the evolution theory is DOA, dead on arrival, and evolution will melt down quicker than the wicked witch of the West. You see, time to the evolutionist is like God. Look at this. The magic ingredient for evolution is time. If you, uh, if you, you see, time is capable of making the universe. It's capable of starting, you forming stars. It's capable of making chemicals, organic life from nothing and change life from simple to complex organisms. So it's quite important. So basically, time performs miracles for evolutionists. Okay, so that's important. So time is their God. Very important for them. We're going we're gonna to see now what the evolution, what each group say. All right, so we're going to look at this. Apparently, about 3.5 billion years ago, life started, according to evolution, and 4.6 billion years ago, Earth formed, so we're working backwards, and then about 13 to 7.5 billion years ago, up to 20, the figures change all the time, there was the Big Bang. Okay, on the other hand, this is what the Bible teaches, that it all happened around about 6,000 years ago, and that the flood happened 4,400 years ago. And um, that's about one and a half thousand years after creation. The difference is three million times. That is a very big difference. Now, last time I was here, I was explaining to you the difference if I had to carry a chart. If my chart for creation was as wide as this screen, I explained to you that my chart for evolution would be so large, it will go from here to Canada. 2,800 miles. Well, I've got a new kind of a scale for, to show you. Uh, the new scale I've got is this. The difference between the two is as big as the sun is to the earth. You can fit 1.3 million earths inside the sun while it's twice as big in difference. Okay? This is a big difference between the two. So the two theories do not match. Having said that, how does the Bible tell us how old things are? How does the Bible refer to it? So, in the Bible, it gives us a full genealogy of every person and their dates up to and including the birth of Jesus. So, for example, Seth was born when Adam was 130. 
We have this genealogy in the Bible. Enos was born when Seth was 105. Canaan was born when Enos was 235, and so on. And that's how we work it out. Well, this was originally worked out by a very clever guy. He's an Archbishop James Usher up in the 17th century. Absolutely, incredibly intelligent. This was about 400 years ago. He calculated that the world was created in the night before Sunday, the 23rd of October, 4004 B.C. Yeah, what time? I don't think he hasn't got the time. He hasn't worked out the time. Well, I am sure James Usher was incre inc incredibly intelligent, and we could take his word for some of this stuff, but I don't think you can be that specific, to be absolutely honest. For starters, we don't know whether these dates were births, days, or conception, and why would they give birth exactly on their birthday? So I'm not sure it can be that exact, but nevertheless, about 6,000 years is about right as far as the Bible is concerned. That's what the plain and straightforward reading of the Bible will tell us, all right? So if you want to read it straightforwardly, you don't want to impose on it our own ideas, then the Bible is pretty clear. It's around about 6,000 years. So what do evolutionists mainly use to support their claim that the world is old? So we're going to look at what evolutionists say now. The first one is they claim the world is old because apparently there are some distant stars. That proves the universe is old. They say that the earth has got layers that was formed over millions of years. That proves that the earth is old. They claim that life started and, and how, and it took a long time to evolve. Well, that apparently proves that the earth is old. They also claim that um, you can age fossils and rocks using this thing called radio, radiometric dating. Apparently that proves that the world is billions of years old. Just so you know, we're gonna cover radiometric dating in the second half very briefly, but just so you know, it's nothing to do with radios and nothing to do with dating. Okay, it's uh, far more exciting than that. All right. Bible-believing Christians are completely and unnecessarily divided over this issue, believe it or not. Now, majority of you here didn't have a problem with that, but believe you me, some Christians have got problems with this where they want to fit in Christianity's the biblical account of creation, the young age, with the worldly account of the world, which is an old age. They, they are divided over this issue. Um, some believe that it's young over six literal days, and others who say the world is obviously billions of years old, they impose the evolutionary idea into the Bible. They force it. They force it straight into the Bible. They claim that the Bible did not mean what it said when it obviously, uh, they, so they obviously decided to change God's word to fit with the idea. So, here we go. So, the idea of old earth started late 1700s, early 1800s. I'm going to take you through this history very, very quickly. Started off with a guy, James Hutton. There are many other people involved in this, but I'm going to just bring out some main characters for you. First of all, James Hutton, who was a Scotsman. So, he was British. He, started, he wrote a book uh, called Theory of Earth. And he started this new word, this new idea called uniformitarianism, which is a basically, it's a big word. It basically means this, that the way we see things happen today is the way they've always happened. In other words, today, the present is the key to the past. So, um, he basically didn't allow for this idea of catastrophe. He didn't like the idea of the global flood. He called it uniformitarianism, which means everything continued as we see them today. Of course, this guy was known not to like the Bible. He didn't like the Bible. His book, he said, and he said, um, and, and the earth is much older than people think. He actually said it's about 80,000 years old. That's what he said. And he put a lot of doubt in people's hearts. Up till then, they were, they were believing that it was 6,000 years. Then came along my favorite. This guy, his name is Charles Lyell, sorry, Lyell, who also was Scottish. He... Um, He's British as well, bless him. He wrote a book called Principles of Geology, who expanded on ideas on guys before him. These were the guys before him, William Smith, who was an Englishman, and George Cuvier, he was German. All right, so got a German in the mix there. Lyle absolutely hated the Bible. Every, he hated it so much, the hatred oozes out of each page. He said things like this. He talked about ancient doctrines and those who rest on scriptural authority. He talked about how religion does not mix with sound philosophy. In other words, if you are a Christian, you cannot have sound philosophy. Those whose beliefs are founded on religious prejudices, men of superior talent. He's talking about himself here. 
um, man of superior talent who thought for themselves, okay, so he could think for himself apparently. He just scoffed at the Bible all through this book, all sorts of attack, one after another. Okay, Charles Lyell said the layers on earth that we see today happened over millions of years. Until, up until then, people believed that these layers came from the global flood. They, they knew that these layers happened from the flood, but he changed that idea. He didn't, he, didn't want, he wanted to put millions of years in there. And so in 1859, the Englishman, another British, Charles Darwin came along, and with these millions of years behind him, he decided to write this famous book called on, on the Origin of Species. In fact, it was the book from Charles Lyell that convinced him as he was on his tour for five years. Do you know what qualifications each person had? Okay, this is very important, okay, because um, you need to know what, they, what their qualifications are. Let's start with the first guy, James Hutton. He was actually a farmer. He was an agriculturist. He wasn't a scientist. He just took over the business from his family in Berwickshire. He made people with that skill uh, doubt the Bible. Charles Lyell, Charles Lyell, sorry, he's a lawyer. <laughs> Uh, he's not a scientist. He's just a lawyer. And uh, he made people doubt the flood. Do you know what is the difference between a good lawyer and a bad lawyer? Well, a bad lawyer can let a case drag out for several years, while a good lawyer can make it drag out even longer. Charles Darwin was a college dropout, later got a degree in theology. That's all his qualification. That's all he had. He was not a scientist. He made people doubt the Creator. In case you're interested, George Cuvier was a zoologist, not a scientist, and William Smith was a drainage engineer and a surveyor, not a scientist. Yet, our education system refers to these guys as the greatest scientists ever. In fact, here we go, look, Charles Darwin is called history's greatest scientist. Look, if this guy is a scientist, then so is the average pastor. That is absolute. In fact, the average pastor has got more qualifications than Charles Darwin, yet they refer to him as the greatest scientist. So, the original, the originally, they thought that the earth was 6,000 years old, but with the help of these guys, so it started off with 6,000, with the help of these guys, by the late 1800s, or by late 1800s, they were teaching the earth is 90 million years old. By mid-1900s, they were teaching the earth is 3.5 billion years old, and now we're up to 4.6 billion years old. And the universe is supposed to, supposedly 13.7 and even older. The earth, listen to this, the earth has been aging since the late 1700s, 21 million years every year. Okay, and I thought I was aging. Uh, this professor of California Institute of Technology said, if we just sit back, and I love this quote, and relax and wait for a while, the earth may be six to eight, even 10 billion years old. Eons means billions, by the way, in geology terms. Does this sound like science to you? changing all the time. This curator who's an administrator of a museum uh, of the history of science in Oxford said, I myself have little doubt that in England it was long age uniformitarian, this is the word we learned from James Hutton earlier, uniformitarian geology and the theory of evolution that changed us from a Christian to a pagan nation. This guy is saying that because of old ages that we've been teaching our kids, we swapped in this country religion from Christianity to pagan, not from Christianity to science. We changed to pagan. That's what we we've went to. So evolution is not just anti-science, which I point out very readily in my debates. That makes me very popular. It's a false religion. It's a completely false religion. It has deadly consequences. It's very important we know this. Now, okay, so those Christians um, who were living in the... Um, during those times and being influenced by the idea of old ages, um, we needed to fix this. So, a Scottish math 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 mathematician <laughs> called Thomas Chalmers uh, came along and wanted to fix and rescue God's Word. You see, I don't think God's Word needs fixing. He should have left it just the way it is. It's doing fine just the way it is. So, some, so Thomas Chalmers introduced the idea of the gap theory in 1814. He basically said this, there, there are billions of years between verse 1 and 2 of the Bible. 
If that's the case, then the fossils we see in the layers today, you see, these people are so taken in by the idea that these layers represent millions of years, they have to somehow include it and incorporate it into the Bible. So this guy, who's obviously intelligent, um, distorted, in a way, what uh, God has said, and he said he slotted in his idea between verse 1 and 2, saying that these fossils we see in layers are animals that must have evolved over millions of years. But you see, there are a number of problems with this. I'm going to take you through it very quickly. I am sure some of you will come across people who will try to convince you this, and you need to know the answers to those questions. And here we are. Problem number one. According to the Bible, God created animals on day six. Well, he didn't create them billions of years before that which is what this guy is suggesting between verse 1 and 2. The Bible doesn't say he created any living thing um, before the sixth day of creation. Problem number two is that the gap theory will also mean that there has, was death before man. Well, what does the Bible say as far as death is concerned? Death came because of man, because of Adam. It came after man. But his theory would suggest that it came before. And it did, in this case, if it came before, then we came through death. We arrived. Men arrived because of death. You see, that means um, dead fossils existed before Adam. Problem number three. God did say days, uh, uh, God said between days one and six that it was good. In fact, after day seven, he said it was very good. Now, how could Adam and Eve be standing on dead fossils and God call it good or even very good? How could he do that? It's never going to happen. God even hates suffering. He even hates death. Because you see, when the first death happened that's recorded in the Bible, that's when Cain killed Abel, this is what God said. He said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to, to me from the ground. So now you are uh, cursed from the earth, which has, happened, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. God hates sin and God hates death. That doesn't sound like a God who's pleased with what Cain did, right? He continues to say, When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive and a vagabond, which means a, a tramp and a wanderer, you shall be on earth. Does that sound like a God who actually is endorsing what just happened? Or that he will be standing on dead fossils and he would call it good? Is that what it sounds like it? I would say God is extremely unhappy about what just took place there, and he's very angry about it. So God wouldn't stand on dead fossils and call it good. God basically said, get out of my sight. I don't even want to see you. Right. Out of desperation to force millions of years into the Bible, they came up with other theories. I'm going to take you through those theories very quickly so you understand what happened. You're going to love this one. This one is called the pictorial theory. Have you heard of the pictorial theory before? Anyone? No. Okay, here's a theory, believe it or not, that's supposed to be the six days in which God revealed creation to Moses. So basically on day one, God revealed a bit of, bit of um, bits of the creation. On day two, he revealed a little bit more of the creation. But you see, if that's correct, then the resting on the seventh day would mean nothing would mean absolutely nothing. This is what it says in Exodus 20. It says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them and rested the seventh day. So he made everything in six days, not revealed to Moses in six days. So it wasn't the days how they were revealed. It was how God created things. It was very obvious. They came up with the, another theory here called intermittent day theory. This says that every day was a 24-hour period, but between those days was a long, long period of time. Okay, long periods of time. Again, there's a problem with the Sabbath issue. Why would they rest on the seventh day if there were long days between them, between those days? It won't make sense. And again, there would be death and suffering before Adam, and again, that would make not sen no sense at all. I'm going to tell you a couple more. They came up with another one called progressive creationism which is similar to the day-age theory. They both believe that the day in Genesis is not a literal 24-hour period, but it represents millions of years. That's what it means. Those who believe in progressive theory, they don't actually believe in evolution. What they believe is that God intervened every now and then and created a little bit. Okay? So in every now and then, he created something. So that's progressive creation. So he intervened every now and then. Um, 
either one of those for either one of those theory to be true the meaning of the day the word day must change in the Bible that's what we've got here so I'm going to briefly explain to you what's wrong with this in a minute the word day in a minute and finally the theistic evolutionist I don't know whether a Christian should ever even consider this one here or any of the others for, the, for that matter this is my favorite though these are Christians who reject the entire creation account of Genesis okay that's outright come straight out some believe that God the only role that God played in creation is that he released this big explosion big bang and the rest of it just happened on its own and every now and then God intervened a little bit and he sort of superseded with the with the natural processes okay now to support the old age theory you need to go against the plain and straightforward reading of the Bible so to distort this meaning you would have to distort the meaning of the word day now I'm going to explain to you something if you were to take the Bible with you and walk into a desert and read it on your own and come out after you've read the whole Bible you would never come out thinking that the Bible is imposing thousands of millions of years into into the world you would never come out thinking that the world is millions or billions of years old you would never do that in order for it to happen you have to have a presupposed idea that it is and force that idea into the Bible so it's not a the straightforward and natural reading of the Bible that will encourage someone to have that kind of uh, idea and that is the reason why personally I believe in the literal six-day 24-hour period creation over a period of 6,000 years now here are the facts I'm gonna take you through the facts very quickly the word Yom is used 2,300 times in the Old Testament but it's only questioned in Genesis chapter 1 that's just amazing anywhere else we agree that the word Yom which is the word for day means a 24-hour period we only question it in chapter 1 very incredible no one would argue that the Israelites who march around the walls of Jericho for seven days said, oh, no, they didn't march around for seven days. They march around for an undefined period of time. Nobody would say that. But they obviously say it when it comes to Genesis chapter 1. Apparently, a day means a day everywhere in Genesis except for chapter 1. There's something wrong there. Incorrectly, some people argue that a day does not mean one day because of this verse over here 2 Peter 3 8 they say but beloved do not forget this one thing that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day it goes on to say but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night now here's the thing this sentence is not changing the meaning of the word day for us it's just telling us that to God that it doesn't mean anything to God he's outside time he's not affected by the word day it means nothing for God a day to us is a day to God it could be a thousand years even more because it's not affected by time now explain to me this if a day means nothing to God why should a day mean nothing to us that's what we're trying to do here aren't we in Genesis 1 we're trying to distort day the word day why if it means nothing to God to God suddenly it means nothing to us let's just say God one day says I don't know Peter come here I want you to do something in two days time does that mean Peter has got two million years to do it now the principle is quite attractive you know God tells you to do something and you don't and you think oh I've got an undefined period of time here to do it in yeah okay but it sounds very attractive but that would be distorting what the meaning of day means doesn't it all God is saying is that what you can do in two days or one day I can do a thousand years worth of stuff that's all that God is saying with this verse over here the day is relative to God so I'm going to take you through each one of the points a day is relative to God not to us God is explaining what day means to him and he's outside time that's all he's trying to do he's not trying to change the day the meaning of day for the six day creation he's not trying to do that the six day creation was written for us it's relative to us not relative to God the second thing is the Greek word used here is not even Yom so the people who argue this have got a problem it's not even Yom it's Hamera and it's not used in Genesis it's used in this verse the verse here has nothing to do with the creation days it's about the second coming of Jesus and he's just saying be patient because a day to God is like a day to you is like a thousand to God and vice versa saying he's not affected by time so stop doing that 
So it doesn't mean billions. So even if a day was to mean thousands, the world is actually only thousands of years old, not billions, which is what people are trying to tell us. So even if you try to use this argument to uh, support your claim, you'd still not work. Okay, here's another one. I love this one. In Psalms chapter 90, verse 4, For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday in its past and like a watch in the night. Now, here's the problem. The Hebrew word here, a lot of translations, a lot of uh, translated Bibles are using the word day here, but it's actually, it's, it's ethmol, which means yesterday. So the confusion here is that some Bibles translate that to the word day, but it actually means yesterday because it's, the word is used as ethmol. So some, trans, some translations are incorrect on this. Nevertheless, it means it's not a day, it's yesterday. And a thousand years to God is like what? Is like yesterday. It doesn't support the idea of billions. To humans, how long is yesterday? It's still a day. And again, God is pointing out that he is not affected by time. He's outside time. I reckon that God knew that one day some wise guy was going to come along and try to change the meaning of the 24-hour period to millions of years. So this is what he did. He said, God named every one of those days very carefully as evening and morning. So God wanted to avoid that confusion about a day meaning more than 24-hour period. He actually slotted in there the words evening and morning. But he knew that wasn't going to be enough. He knew somebody's come and come along and ignore that bit and say, no, it didn't mean that there are millions of years between those days. Okay, so he numbered them. He said, one, two, three, four, five, six. Well, you know what? God knew that wasn't going to be good enough. Numbering them wasn't good enough because they were going to slot something in between. So what did he do? He spelt it out. He said, And for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. How remarkable. Why do we still have problems with this? And you know what's interesting is that the people who are having problems with the six-day creation are Christians who are supposed to believe in the Bible and believe what God's Word says. It's the Christians who are having problems with this, by the way. It's not the atheists that have to convince this, too. It's the Christians who are having some difficulties with this. I'm glad to see that most of us here don't have this problem, but it is a problem out there, believe it or not. In case you're still not convinced, okay, I'm taking you through a couple of things. The word day uh, with a number is used 410 times in Genesis. It's used 400. And whenever it's used like that, it always means a regular and an ordinary day. Well... The word evening and morning, without the word day, is used 38 times. That's how many times it's used in Genesis. And it always means a 24-hour ordinary day. The word evening and morning with the word day is used 23 times in Genesis, and it always means an ordinary day. And the word night with day is used 52 times, and it always means an ordinary day. Now, have a look at this. God put them all in one chapter. So we can't get confused about the 24-hour day period in creation. There is absolutely no way we, are, we, can, we can misunderstand this. Which part of a 24-hour period are we not getting? For those who obviously have a difficulty with this. Now, no other biblical scholar accused the writers of Genesis to mean any other than a 24-hour period. This scholar, his name is Dr. Pun from the science department of Witten College, who believes, by the way, in billions of years. This is not a guy who thinks that it all happened in a few year, thousand years. He believes in billions of years. But look what he says. He says, it is apparent that the most straightforward understanding of Genesis record is that God created heaven and earth in six solar days, that man was created on the sixth day, the death and chaos entered the world after the fall of Adam and Eve, and that all of the fossils were a result of a catastrophic universal deluge which spared only Noah's family and the animals therewith. He admits that the Bible is not telling us that there is billions of years in there. He's admitting that. It does not talk of billions of years, but he chooses to believe in billions of years. That is his choice. He, he forces that idea into the Bible. The Bible doesn't teach it. Here's another one from a guy called Charles Hodge, who's actually in the systematic theology uh, at Princeton Seminary, believe it or not. It is, of course, admitted that taking this account, which is talking about Genesis, by itself, it would be most natural to understand the word, that's the word day, 
in its ordinary sense. But if that sense brings the mosaic account into conflict with the facts, we're talking about science in the old ages, and another sense avoids such conflict, then it's obligatory on us to adopt the other. So what is he saying? He's saying, if science proves that God's word is, is wrong, then we are obliged to change God's word. That's what he's saying. How many of us know that science always changes, but God's word is forever true and remains true? But he's saying that man's word goes above God's word. You see, you see God did not use evolution. He didn't use evolution. Even this well-known atheist, this is an atheist, by the way, who wrote in, uh, atheist philosopher who wrote in Nature magazine, he wrote those words. He said, the evolutionary process is rife with happenstance, which means chance, contingency, which means accident, incredible waste, death, pain, and horror. The God implied by evolutionary theory and the data of natural history, he's talking about the millions of years here, is not a loving God who cares about his products. He is careless, wasteful, indifferent. That means he has no interest or concern. Almost diabolical. He is certainly not the sort of God to whom anyone would be inclined to pray. And I totally agree with that statement. A God who will bring into life in that method would not be a God of the Bible. That's not the God of the Bible. And this atheist knows it, but we have some Christians who have problems with this. I'm going to give you a couple of quotes and we're nearly done. This Hebrew scholar says, who is a professor in Oxford University and specialist in, in interpreting, believe it or not, of Scripture. He knows the Hebrew language inside out. He's a specialist in this area. And he does not believe in the Bible. When he was asked, what did the writers of Genesis intend to convey? In other words, what did the writers of Genesis mean? Was it supposed to be literal, allegorical, or poetic? He said, for as far as I know, there is no professor of Hebrew or Old Testament at any world-class university, you know, like posh superiority there, who does not believe that the writers of Genesis 1 through 11 intended to convey their readers the idea that, one, Creation took place in the series of six days, which were approximately the same as the days of 24 hours we now experience. He knows how to interpret the Bible. Number two, the figures contained in Genesis genealogies provided by simple addition, a chronology from the beginning of the world up to later stages in biblical story. Three, Noah's flood was intended to be a worldwide and extinguished um, human and animal life except for those in the ark. This guy is a non-Christian. He knows how to interpret the Bible. How incredible is that? He seems to understand that the Bible is not saying that Genesis is a myth. It's allegorical. He's saying is what it says on the tin. We can trust the Bible. That's what it's saying. There's no confusion about that. So why do we, some Christians, have difficulties with this at some times? Why do we have a problem with that? There's nothing compatible between the Bible and evolution or billions of years. There's nothing compatible with that. If you want to know more about this subject, and these books are available at the back, you need to look at this one, these two books, Unformed and Unfilled, the, the six day, uh, days of Genesis. It covers this subject in much greater detail. Now listen to this. A friend showed me this book that she got from her school. It's a book about Bible stories for kids. Guess how the opening page starts? It says millions of years. The rest of the, Bible, the book is actually quite interesting, and it talks about stories in the Bible. But why does it start with millions of years ago? Why did they add this in the beginning? They're implying that the Bible speaks of millions of years. Clearly, it doesn't. Is this educating our kids? This isn't a school, by the way. Is this educating our kids, or is it indoctrinating them to, weigh, to think one way? How is that child going to grow up thinking about the Bible? The rest of the Bible is very easy. The rest of that book is very easy to follow, and it just talks about the Bible. Why couldn't it just start it from there? I was once discussing this book, a book of Genesis with a friend. I was having a peaceful and friendly discussion, as that, this, uh, <laughs> as that shows. Um, this person is an educated lecturer who knows the Bible extremely well, and he was suggesting that the Genesis was a myth. And of course, to me, that was like a red rag to a bull. And uh, I sort of reacted in a very patient and loving way. <laughs> I am very passionate, okay? 
That's why I do those debates with people. I'm very passionate, and uh, I told him in no uncertain terms that the Bible was not a myth, and it could be trusted. I would love to come back one day and just talk about, just, about Genesis, how we know that scientifically, um, uh, uh, scientifically, logically, theologically, how we know it's not a myth. I'd love to come down and do this one day. But before he left, he implied that I was a Christian fundamentalist. And I thought, I don't know what that is. So it doesn't sound good. I'm not happy with that. I better go and find out, okay? So I went and found out what a Christian fundamentalist is, and this is what I found. It turns out that a Christian fundamentalist is someone who believes in the inerrancy of the Bible. That means the Bible has no errors. That's why it's important you use the right translation because some translations are not to be used if you want to defend God's Word. The, the fundamentalists believe that the, the, the inerrancy of the Bible, well, I checked that box. Well, number two, the Bible, the, those who are fundamentalists are, believe that in the virgin birth of Christ, yeah, that's me too. Well, apparently, those who believe that the, in the bodily resurrection of Christ, I tick that box as well. So I'm sweating now. I'm more and more. Believes in the physical return of Christ. Well, yes, I believe in the physical return of Christ, so I check that box. And those who believe in the substitutionary atonement of Christ on the cross, that means Jesus took the punishment in our place. And yes, I tick that box. And finally, the literal nature of the biblical account, especially regarding Christ's miracles and the creation account in Genesis. And I tick all boxes. It sounds like he was right. I'm in trouble. I'm a Christian fundamentalist. And you know, I don't actually know how you could be a Christian in any other way. If we cannot tick those boxes, then we have problems, right? If you want to be a Christian, these are the things we need to believe in. Well, it's actually like saying, if you're an evolutionist, oh, you can be an evolutionist and not believe a word that Charles Darwin said, or not believe a word that the book he wrote talks about evolution. You can't do that. You have to believe the book. And that's what it is exactly when it comes to believing the Bible. In Colossians 1, 6, it says that for him, for by him, that's Jesus, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and by him. Now, here's the thing. If Jesus did everything, if he created everything, then he should know when is the beginning shouldn't he? Jesus should know when the beginning is. Well, what does Jesus say? Jesus said, he answered them and said to them, have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? Wow. He was talking to the Pharisees at the time, believe it or not. These are people who knew the Bible so well they could recite all of Deuteronomy by heart. He was insulting them. He was saying, didn't you read? Don't you know? Don't you know those things? I think Jesus is going to be saying that to some of us. Don't you know these things? It was written in there. You see, Jesus apparently is endorsing the beginning is when Adam was created. That's the beginning. So it apparently, Jesus is endorsing Genesis chapter 1 because that's what it says in Genesis chapter 1. Well, if he's wrong and the world is billions of years old, I'm going to say Jesus' reputation and credibility is at stake here, right? That's what the, that is why it's important for creationists to get it correctly because it's God's word at stake here. Well, if Jesus said that this is how it happened, and if Jesus said it's not a myth, then I believe it. I believe in a six-day creation 6,000 years ago, approximately 6,000 years ago. Apparently, atheists know this, what the Bible is saying, but some of us are having problems with that. Okay, so what about science? Where's, how does that fit in? Does the Bible and science conflict with each other? Now, that's what we're going to talk about in part two. We're going to talk about what does science say about this evidence. It's going to be obviously fascinating to discover, well, can we tell for sure? But here's the thing. How can we use science principles to work out the age of anything? You see, we have got things like telescopes to look at things that are far away, and we have microscopes to look at little things, but we don't have ageoscopes or pastoscopes, right? I really don't know what he's looking at. I, I have no idea what that thing is. It, it's just a random picture. <laughs> so how can you tell? How can you tell how old things are anyway? Okay, so this is why I'm going to leave you with a challenge during our break. This is the challenge. We're looking at a car here, 
And uh, the challenge is that you guess how old this thing is. Okay, I want you to guess how old this thing is. And if you guess it correctly, there is a prize for you. And this is the book. There's a prize. I want you to go at the back and put down what year you think it is. But I want you to think about it. I mean, how would you know how old it is? It, do you know it's old because it looks like an old model? Or um, how do you know it's not a replica, for example? And uh, is it young because it's shiny and rust-free? How, how do you know that the guy who had it didn't look after it before? That's why it's shiny and clean. Um, would you know because it has no wear and tear? But how do you know that anybody drove it? Maybe it was sitting in a showroom forever. How would you know that? How would you know how old it is? Uh, how would you know it not, it's not been mishandled or looked after? Either way, to, now, to know whether it's young or old. So what I want you to do is write down what age you think it is. Think about what would have helped you. You can write down saying, oh, it would have helped me if I knew this. Write it down, and if you get the year right, if more than one get it right, I'll look at the questions as to how you would know it was right, and from that, I'm going to decide who the winner is. So we're going to have a break. God bless you. See you later on. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you very much for coming back. <laughs> it's always interesting to see how many people come back after the first uh, half. Um, how many of you decided not to stay? <laughs> okay, none of you. Good. <laughs> I thought you are probably here against your will. But uh, good. Thank you very much for coming back. We have actually a very clear winner. I, I want to announce this one to start with. Um, <laughs> uh, this car apparently is three million... BC. <laughs> Not just 3 million. Oh no, it's got to be 3 million BC. Uh, it's because it has similarities to a fish, and we all know fishes are millions of years old. So, very good, very good. I think I should give this person a book anyway. It's, his, it's my son. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> you didn't? Oh, it's my other son writing it on your behalf. <laughs> Even better, even better. We do have actually a winner, and I'm telling you, it was very, very close. And I had to uh, make a decision. Uh, it was with great difficulty. So, going back to the subject of how old is the earth, you've seen how difficult it is. If you've never seen a car before, you can imagine how impossible it would be for you to guess the age of a car anyway. Even when you know what cars would look like, that's still a problem. Right, the first half, we talked about how the Bible does not speak of billions of years old. It clearly, the plain and straightforward reading of the Bible, other than what we impose into it, our views, our understanding, our um, approach would affect how we read the Bible. But if you had none of that and you read the Bible, it does not speak of billions of years. It definitely speaks of thousands, 6,000 or so. Okay. Um, before I tell you the age of this car, I'm going to take you through how we would know, okay? And then we're going to apply that principle on how we would know how old the earth is, okay? So we're going to take you through it now. First of all, if you didn't know much about cars, you would probably just guess. You would say, well, you know, it looks old, so it must be old. That will be an opinion. Uh, or you'd say, look, it looks shiny and clean. It's got to be new, hasn't it? Okay, so that's how you do it. Well, or you might be actually much more knowledgeable. You might say it has to be less than 125 years old because the first car that was ever made that's petrol powered is actually invented in 1885. So now you put a date limit on it. You say, well, it can't be older than 1885. So obviously, three million years is out. <laughs> okay, the next thing is, if you know the make and model of the car, whoa, that is very good. That's very close. You would think, well, if that make and model, you, if, especially if you know when they made them in 1954, well, that will give you a real good clue. Well, if you guess 1954, you were wrong. All you know is that the car cannot be older than 1954. That's all you know. Next thing. Here's another clue. The last 10 cars were made in 1966. Now, if you knew that, and you're the sort of person who, is, who wants to sell you the idea that this car is old, would use that clue and say, there you go, 100% definite proof, this car is definitely no older than 1966. Well, if you're that person, then you are wrong. You have to do something else. You need to look inside the car to find out. Now, that, I know you don't have that privilege. I was going to bring it down here. But, um, <laughs> but um, 
it didn't, uh, finance didn't allow. <laughs> so we're going to look inside the car. You have to take my word for it. This is actually a real car, by the way. It's not a picture. It actually does really exist. The first factory fitted air conditioning made by this manufacturer in their cars started in 1969. So now, but there is a factory air conditioning installed in this car. Therefore, well, it cannot be older than 1969. It's called the limiting factor, the things that limits its age. Here's another clue. It has a factory fitted iPod ready sound system. This was invented in 2001. Well, what does that tell you? It tells you that the car cannot be older than 2001. You see, if you had the luxury of looking inside, you would have known this. I know it's a little bit unfair. That's why I asked, how would you know and what would help you? This way I would know how to re judge your uh, judgment. Okay, well, you just know it can't be older than 2001 now. But here's another clue. The engine runs on lithium iron phosphate, phosphate batteries, completely by batteries. Well, these kind of batteries were invented in 2002. Oh, wow. That has limited. It's another limiting factor. This car cannot be older than 2002, but it gets better. The first lithium iron phosphate car ever invented, so they got the battery, but they didn't do the first car until 2010. Well, that totally affects the limiting factor, doesn't it? Completely. Well, how old is this car then? Well, this car is not decades old. It is only a few months old. It was officially released in April 2011 at a Denver auto show, not decades old, but just a few months old. Now, I have a problem because this was released at 2011, and I've got two guesses here that are very close. This one says 2011. Okay, so technically this would be the winner, Andrew Calvert, technically. Oh, but you didn't win. <laughs> Because this one won, because he said he aged it using radiometric dating. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's much more accurate, and we know how accurate radiometric dating is. Okay, so he got it right. Okay, that's not the reason why he won. It's because he actually said six months old, which makes it exactly April. April. Mr. John, you have won yourself. <laughs> He was trying not to win. <laughs> he doesn't want it. That's how humble he is. He's saying, I don't deserve to win. I was trying not to. And therefore, and by not wanting, you see, this is what the Bible says. You see, if you humble yourself, <laughs> not try to be first, try to be last, you become automatically first. I have to be technical on this. So I'm afraid, unless you pass it on to Andrew yourself, this is yours. Well done. Give him a hand, everybody. Okay, well done. You've seen, you've seen how difficult it is to work out the state. Well, this is how we have to do. How would you work out the age of anything? Well, using this principle, you can work out the age of anything. Your agenda will dictate what dates you use. That's very important. Okay, in this case, we're trying to work out the age of the earth. So how old is it? Is it young? And how can we tell? And what are the limiting factors? So here we go. I'm going to give you a quick story before we start. About 30 years ago, a guy called Dan Jones, he was walking along the river, and he found a rock with a fishing reel embedded inside of it, okay? He found a fishing reel. They radiometric dated the rock. They took the date of the rock, and they came up with 3 million years old. Then, but there is a problem here, because the f first fishing reel was patented in 1874. That's less than 140 years. So how old is this rock? Is it, as the radiometric dating says, 300 million years old, or is it less than 140 years old? Well, obviously, the radiometric dating did not work. But this is what I want you to see. This is what's interesting. The chairman of the department from the University of Tennessee in Chattanooga said, he saw this, when he saw it, this is what he said, I am the chairman of the department, and I say, this does not exist. It's a figment of our imagination. You see, what's fascinating about this comment is the fact that he never questioned the theory, did he? He never questioned the radiometric dating theory. He actually questioned whether the object existed in the first place. He cannot see that object anymore because it's questioning his theory. And <laughs> it's not an isolated incident. Look at this. In March 2005, 
a lady called Mary Schweitzer discovered a T-Rex bone, that's her job, T-Rex dinosaur bone, with blood cells and soft tissue that was still flexible inside the bone. They all panicked and they, <laughs> because they knew that it couldn't be 65 million years old as they say that dinosaurs last lived because they cannot last that long with blood cells inside bones. They all practiced their Victor Meldrup impressions and they all said, I don't believe it. I, I don't know how to do it, but there it is. They made it difficult for her to publish her finding because evolutionists reject anything that goes against their theory. They censor it and they try not to reveal it very readily. Okay, this Mary Schweitzer had a hard time convincing her reviewer to publish her findings. She said, I had one reviewer tell me that he didn't care what the data said. He knew that what I was finding wasn't possible. She wrote back and said, what can I do? What data would convince you? And he said, none. Okay? You see, evolution, is, evolution has nothing to do with science. It's a deceitful religious theory. It's a, a, about the origin of mankind and it disguises itself as science. And this is important, we need to know this. Right, last time I was here, I spoke about the six meanings of evolution. I'm gonna take you through it very quickly, and then I'm gonna use each one of those meanings to show you how the world is actually young, how the earth is young. Here it comes, I'm gonna tell you one at a time. You will see the stages I go through and you know when the end is coming this way. Cosmic evolution is basically the Big Bang hypoth hypothesis. It's supposedly where time, space, and matter originated from nothing, okay? They tell you that, uh, well, well, this is the thing. What they don't tell you is that this breaks every known law of physics. They don't tell you that. The next thing they use is chemical evolution. They tell you that this is the idea where we got all the chemicals, all 92 elements from hydrogen and helium using, uh, through fusion in the star. What they don't tell you is that it's impossible to go past the iron element using that principle. I spoke about this in great detail last time. You can have a free DVD if you, were, um, if you weren't here and you can have a copy anyway regardless. It's free, it's available anytime. Stellar evolution is the next one. The, this is the idea where the stars formed from dust clouds on their own. This is the thing they don't tell you, that it breaks known law of the known gas laws that we, ha we have and they haven't, they've never observed a single star form in this way. That also matters. Again, this my talk is in greater detail in the previous uh, visit. Organic evolution, this is the idea that life started from primordial soup. I love this one. It's usually one of my uh, greatest points I use in my debates. What they don't tell you is that it goes against the law of biogenesis. We actually have a law that says this is not possible. We actually have this law. Life cannot come from non-life, full stop. It doesn't happen. We've known this for at least the last 300 years. Okay, macroevolution. This is the idea that uh, one kind of animal can produce another kind. What they don't tell you that genetically this is impossible. Darwin didn't know this. We know it now. Why are we teaching it? Genetically, it's impossible for any kind of animal to produce a different kind of animal because it will defy the genetic understanding that we know now. Even mutation cannot account for it without fitness cost. It's, very, it's great fun making those, doing those debates based on this knowledge. Microevolution, the idea that there is a variation within a kind. This is the only science we can observe, test, and demonstrate. That means a dog can produce a variety of dogs, but it will always produce a dog. A cat can produce a variety of cats, but it will always produce a cat. We can clearly see that. Well, today we're going to talk about how old is the Earth. We're going to use each one of those principles to show you that the world in fact, the universe is young. Here it comes. Let's start with cosmic evolution. This theory breaks the fundamental laws of science. Let me show you what they are. There are just a few of them, by the way. I won't go into each one of those. You'll be very pleased to know. Uh, but to overcome this problem, this scientist says the current laws of physics did not apply during the Big Bang. This one said an infinitely dense universe is where the laws of physics and even space, time, and time break down. Let me ask you a question before we continue. What would you call an event that breaks every known law of physics, every known law of science? I would call it a miracle. Why are these people calling Christianity a religion? Tell me, is this science so far or is it faith? If it breaks the law, then it's faith. 
And that's how you know when a theory is bad, by the way. If it breaks the law, known laws of science, then it's a bad theory. How come evolution is getting away with this? Let me give you an example of how the Big Bang breaks the laws of physics. I'm going to go through those very quickly. This is one called the conservation of angular momentum. It goes like this. If you have an object that's spinning, say anticlockwise, and bits break off it, then the bits that break off would spin in the same direction. That's easy. It's not a complicated theory. Okay, let's see what the Big Bang says. Somewhere between 18 to 20 billion years ago, by the way, that number changes all the time. It's very convenient. You know, they've got that um, um, flexibility. All of the matter in the universe was compressed into a tiny space, no larger than the dot on a page. Some say smaller. This dot spun faster and faster until it exploded, thus creating the universe and everything in it. So here is the problem. The angular momentum would have caused the sun to spin fast, but instead it spins slowly, while the planets actually spin quickly. Not only that, but the sun has 99% of the mass of the whole solar system, but only 2% of the angular momentum. It is contradicting the theory. The sun should have about 700 times more angular momentum than all the planets put together, and this is just one of the few problems that the, the Big Bang cannot explain. Why does the sun have most of the mass, but nearly none of the momentum? That's a big question. Well, this known solar system evolutionist admits the ultimate origin of the solar system's angular momentum remains obscure. Oh, really? And it gets much better. If the solar system was a result of the Big Bang, then why do Venus, Uranus, and Pluto, which is now called a dwarf planet, by the way, all rotate backwards? In fact, Uranus is tilted 98 degrees and spins on its side slightly backwards. It could not have been because of a giant impact. Some people say, well, it was a giant impact that changed it all. But here's the problem. If that's the case, then that would not change the orbital planes of its larger moons, which are also tipped over. Okay, out of 200 known moons in the solar system, 30 have backward, backwards orbits, defying the theory. Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, and uh, have moons orbiting in both directions. That's really messing things up. Apparently, some galaxies disobey the Big Bang rules. They spin backwards. Look at this one. I love this one. Goofy planet or galaxy spins in wrong direction. Why does this silly, uneducated galaxy spin backwards? This guy says it goes, he goes on to say, it's pretty clear that there are both clockwise and anticlockwise spiral arms. Something funny is going on. <laughs> I think it's hilarious. You know, what is funny is the fact that he, never, he would never question the theory. He would question the funny galaxy. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? The galaxy is there to tell him something. But he's ignoring the facts and going with the theory because the theory cannot be touched. Saturn rings are ex expanding away from the planet. This is also, there is also nonstop erosion. This guy says, yet nonstop erosion poses a difficult problem for the very existence of Saturn's opaque rings the expected bombardment rate would polarize, pulverize, which means crush, the entire system in only how many years? 10,000 years. Well, Jeffrey, maybe it didn't pulverize because it's less than 10,000 years old. Do you see what I'm saying? The evidence is actually staring us in the face, but we choose to ignore them. This article dated 1st of February 2011 says, the moon is moving away from the earth. That's a fact. We all know it. We all agree on this. It's moving at about 1.5 inches away per year. I think the moon is fed up of all this evolution talk and is leaving us. That means the moon was closer. That makes sense. Uh, in fact, this article says it was closer by, it was actually 14,000 miles away. That's about 20 times closer than what it is now. And you really need to see this for yourself because this article on BBC website tells you this. If it's 20 times closer, the tides would be so high that it would kill every living thing twice a day. Now, I don't know about you, but living things only die once. Okay, not twice a day. They don't die. This, if the moon began orbiting very near the earth, it would move to its present position within 1.2 billion years. So start from zero, it will be where it is now within less than 1.2 billion years. But evolutionists say the moon is about 4.7 billion years old, or give or take a billion, according to their theory. Well, 
There's a discrepancy there. In fact, those people who know this discrepancy, actually, those astronomers call it the lunar crisis. By the way, 1.2 billion is the maximum it can be. It wasn't 1.2 billion. It's just a limiting factor, isn't it? We're working with limiting factors. It cannot be billions of years old. I should really stop here, and we should all go home. We should be convinced and ready to go. But no, we do a few more. Still, on the subject of cosmo cosmology, what about comets? Now, this guy says the comets are giant, dirty, and fluffy snowballs. They float through space and orbit around the sun. Look at this. We found over 900 of them. That's good observation. Some of them are called short period comets because they orbit the sun in less than 100 years. So every 100 years they come back. Some say if it orbits every 200, that's still a short period comet. Well, we recorded 205 short period comets. Over 14 of them spin backwards. You know why? Because they want to annoy the Big Bang Theory. As comets move through space, they lose material. Yeah, they lose weight, all right? And for that reason, they have a life expectancy of only 10,000 years. If that's, a, if that's a life expectancy, why do we still have comets? Why do we still have comets? Evolutionists hate the idea that the life expectancy is only 10,000 years. So do you know what they did? In 1950, this Dutch astronomer, Dutch astronomer Jan Hendrik Oort, as a, as a means to resolve a paradox, in other words, he panicked, and he had to think of a way to come up with an idea quickly. He hypothesized spherical cloud of comets which may lie roughly 50,000 astronomical units away. So listen to this. He panicked, so he invented an idea that there were clouds somewhere far away we cannot see, so far away, 50,000, it made sure we can see it, 50,000 astronomical units is a very far away distance. It's one astronomical unit is between here and the sun. So he invented this magical cloud far away where it magically creates comets for us when they run out. That's very nice of them, to replace the ones that we're losing. Listen to this, no one has ever seen this, by the way, they call it the Oort cloud. Yet this article said, Oort proposed a cloud of comets surrounding the solar system based on mathematical errors. Science articles and the internet go to it now. It's full of this rubbish that they still talk about it, even though it's very well known that it didn't exist. Here, look at this. This famous scient evolutionist scientist said, Many scientific papers are written each year about the Oort cloud, its properties, its origins, its evolution. He is right. Yet there is not a shred of direct observational evidence for its existence. Let me translate that for you. It doesn't exist. It's as simple as that. So, with this kind of imagination, Mr. Oort should get a job working for Walt Disney and should be writing imaginative stories and make a good, honest living from it. He's obviously good at it. Okay, no wonder the Bible says, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament, which means the skies, shows his handiwork. We'll do one more about the cosmology thing and move on. The earth is like a big magnet. It's been losing its strength every year, ever since we've started recording it. It turns out that it's lost 10% since 150 years ago. It means it used to be stronger. It's very easy. According to this, working backwards, it used to be stronger twice as much every 1,450 years. Which means that if you're a creationist and you believe the world was 6,000 years old, there's no problem for you. Because 6,000 years, years ago, it was only 16 times stronger. Totally bearable. In fact, there are scientific proofs. Uh, we have scientific evidence to prove that that kind of magnetic uh, levels could actually be quite healthy for you. We can cover that in another session one day. But 20,000 years ago, 20,000 only, not anymore, it would have been 16,000 times stronger. That's a big problem if you're an evolutionist who believes in billions of years old. Because the earth would be so hot, all your meals would come ready-made, pre-cooked, <laughs> before you. Unfortunately, so would you. No one would ever be alive if the earth would be so hot the, it's expected the Earth even to melt at that kind of magnetic strength. That's why carbon dating doesn't work for more than a few thousand years old, and that beautifully brings me to my favorite subject, which is carbon dating. So we're going to finish with, with cosmology here. We've seen how in the skies, in the universe, we can see 
that the universe is not old so far. But what about chemically? We're going to talk about chemical evolution, or we're going to talk about how chemically we know that the world is young. So we're going to first of all talk about the periodic table. This is the chemical table, periodic table, and it looks like this. And I'm talking about the base. Um, this is base element 6. This is carbon atomic mass 12. I'm sure you're very excited now, which is a stable element. OK, all you need to know is this. Carbon is a stable element. Carbon-12 is, but carbon-14 is not. In fact, it's not stable, and it eventually goes back to nitrogen. It came from nitrogen, and it goes back to nitrogen. So carbon-C14 is not stable. C12, no problem. OK, here we go. People who say carbon dating proves the Earth is old don't know how carbon dating works or don't know what, di what dates evolutionists are talking about. They're talking about 4.6 billion years ago or don't know what dates creationists are claiming. We're saying 6,000 years ago, or don't know all of the above. Carbon dating can only date plants and animals. You need to know this before I go any further, and th or things that used to be plants or animals, like coal or oil. Now, we all agree uh, that coal and oil comes from living things. For example, oil comes from organisms that once lived, and coal comes from plants. So we got the basics right. Here it is. Since carbon C14 doesn't last very long because it goes back to nitrogen, we just covered a second ago, everything that's older than 50 to 60,000 years old will have no carbon left in it whatsoever. So if it has carbon in it, you need to hear this, if it has carbon in it, it's young. If it's old, it has no carbon in it. It's a simple theory to go with. So if you're, if you're an evolutionist, then anything you date that you say is more than 50 to 60,000 years ago, you cannot find carbon in it or detectable carbon in it. Coal, here's an example. Coal is supposed to be 200 to 300 million years old. That's how old coal is supposed to be. It should have how, many, how much carbon? None. Yet everyone we check, every time we check coal or oil, it seems to have carbon in it. Well, how come? This quote says, if radiocarbon is routinely present in coal, oil, graphite, then the Earth cannot be billions of years old. I agree with this statement. Again, this guy says, no source of coal has ever been found that completely lacks carbon-14. This seems to be an unsolvable mystery to evolutionists. That is correct. It is an unsolvable mystery. Or is it the mystery that the evolution theory exists? You see, if you're a creationist, none of, no problem with all these uh, claims because Carbon was buried recently through the global flood. We'll come to that in a minute. Recently, a sample of the wood found in rock cross classified as Middle Triassic, that's one of the layers in the Earth, by the way, they call them Middle Triassic, supposedly some 230 million years old, gave a C14 date of 33,720 plus or minus 430 years. They double-checked the date. They found it's true. They thought it was contamination. They found it's true and they kept the date. That is the true date of something that's supposed to be 230 million years old. Carbon dating is our friend. I love carbon dating. Material from layers where dinosaurs are found carbon dated at 34,000 years old. Whoa, I thought dinosaurs died 65 million years ago. We're saying we can't detect any carbon if it's older than 50 or 60,000, and yet we've got that in a dinosaur bone. Look at this. Evolutionists always argue that whenever we find something that doesn't fit the theory, it's due to contamination. They argued this on and on until this happened, which is very interesting. They found carbon in diamonds. Diamonds is a very hard material. You cannot get it to contaminate. They found it. They, found, they tested 12 diamonds. They all had carbon in it. Gave an average age of 58,000 years. That's the average eight, age. Evolutionists tell us that diamonds happened between 1 billion and 3.3 billion years ago. So why is there carbon in diamonds? I think I have a theory about that. And I think the theory is this. It's probably because the Earth is only 6,000 years old. That's why, why diamonds has got carbon in it. But I hear you say, wait a minute, John. You just said that the average age for all 12 diamonds is 58,000 years old. But now you say it's only 6,000 years old. So what's going on here? I'm going to tell you quickly what's going on. 
Carbon date gives us older dates than 6,000 years because of these things. And these are not the only thing, by the way, but I'm going to take you through it very quickly. The Earth magnetic field, it used to be stronger. That means the atmosphere would produce less carbon, C14. Therefore, anything that's aged today would be aged older because today we have more carbon. The difference between now and 6,000 years ago would be much greater because in those days less carbon existed. We haven't reached equilibrium. That means the sun is still adding carbon into the air. That means when we compare things to the past, it'll appear to be older. Volcanoes add carbon into the air because the global flood would have caused thousands of volcanoes to, to be erupted. That would have added a huge amount of carbon into the air, aging everything today much older than they should do. The global flood also buried some carbon in plants um, during the flood. It would have buried it with it, affected the balance. The so solar neutrinos from the sun affects the carbon dating and accelerated atomic decay. I can see you're very excited about this. Absolutely. Look. <laughs> I'll come back one day, for those who are interested, and I will take you through carbon dating properly and show you the fallacies and the problems with it, taking you right through it properly. It's great fun, trust me, I love it. But for now, look at this. You are gonna be fascinated with this. In case you thought it takes millions of years to make a diamond, here's a company that's making diamonds for a living called Life Gem UK. Please make a note of this. Making diamonds from your loved ones. You heard me right, I said from your loved ones, not for your loved ones. It says, here it says, a certified high quality diamond created from a lock of hair or the cremated ashes of your loved ones as a memorial to their unique life. How are they doing this? Yeah, I thought it takes billions of years to make diamonds. Okay, in this frequently asked sections it says, what is the process used to make a life gem? The answer, life gems unique technology replicates the process of what takes millions of years naturally to occur within the earth and speeds it up to create a certified high quality diamond in just a matter of months. Hmm, that's interesting. Actually, if you read through the website, they'll tell you how they can take those diamonds to a professional who will check them and not be able to tell the difference. Okay, so now I know that no one has lived millions of years to prove to me that diamonds happened over millions of years or billions of years. But according to this, you can make diamonds in a few months. Now, please tell me which is science and which is belief. Okay, that's important to know. Why do they tell us that it takes billions of years to do something we can do in a few months? Well, I think this is what happened. 6,000 years ago, God created everything. And 4,400 years ago, there was this global flood that buried everything very, very quickly. Diamonds were formed within a few months. See, that works. Let's have another look at this. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is a diamond of someone, believe it or not. What you're looking at is someone's pet or someone's loved one. This is it. They're showing you the real thing on their website. It's remarkable, right? I'm going to do one more thing about chemical um, evolution, and then we're going to move on to the next one. They talk, um, let's talk about helium. Uh, I think we all know what helium is. Helium is the stuff that you put in balloons, you know, at party time, and they float into the air. We're familiar with that. And if you ever try to breathe one of those things in, you can speak with a very high-pitched voice, right? You tried this? Have we all tried this? Do we know all this? Okay, I'm not going to do it now. You know what I'm talking about, right? Okay, so um, it turns out that there is... Uh, the helium shows, shows that the Earth is actually quite young. Helium escapes from the Earth's crust every second from the Earth's crust. We have, at the moment, 3.71 billion tons of helium in the atmosphere. It would have taken less than 2 million years for, for this amount of helium to actually build up in the atmosphere. If the Earth were 4.6 billion years old, there would be so much helium in the atmosphere that we would all sound like Joe Pasquale. I'm not saying that he hasn't got a lovely voice. I actually quite like his voice, but we would all sound like that, okay? They originally thought that the helium in, uh, in, that was escaping into the atmosphere, you know, they hadn't worked it out. Some of the helium was moved, escaping from our atmosphere into, the, into space. They worked out all the figures in their favor. It still showed that it was young. This scientist says, there appears to be a problem with the helium budget of the atmosphere. Do you know why he said that? 
because there appears to be a problem with the helium budget of the atmosphere. There appears there is not enough helium in the atmosphere to account for 4.6 billion years. It cannot be 4.6 billion years old. Another, say, another expert said this helium problem will not go away and it's unresolved. I agree. It's not gone away. It's unresolved. We have a problem. The world cannot be billions of years old. But you know what? It will never change their minds. Do you think that affects the evolutionist? Oh, no. As far as they're concerned, the evolution and the old dates remain. It doesn't affect it. That's because it's religious. It's not science. We've just looked at chemical and how chemical evolution or the chemical um, processes and how it proves young Earth. We're going to now look at the stars. Okay, what evidence do we have in stars to tell us that the world is young? Let's have a look at this. First of all, we've never seen a star form ever, completely never. That we predict that it happens through dust clouds. Well. What they don't tell you is that it breaks all the gas laws that we know. It goes against the laws of physics. Not only that, but we're losing some. So we're not gaining stars, we're losing some. Because every now and then they explode. What do we call an exploding star? A nova. Or a supernova is a nice big one. We call it a supernova. Let's look at the facts here. In our Milky Way galaxy, which is the galaxy we live in, we call it the Milky Way, scientists observed that we only get one supernova every 26 years. In another study, they put thousands of them together, included the small ones, and they discovered the time between explosions is about 100 years. Okay? And here's another thing. When they explode, the bits that fly off, we can continue to see them with our strong telescopes for millions of years. Okay. Based on this information, they've made some predictions, and listen to this prediction. We are told that the supernova remnants, these are the bits that remains after they explode, go through three stages. They go through stage one, two, and three, depending on how old they are. Here comes the first prediction. If the universe is billions of years old, they're going to predict now how many they're going to see of each stage. If the universe is billions of years old, we're going to have those figures. Uh, for stage one, we have two. Stage two, 2,260, and stage three, 5,000. If the universe is 7,000 years old, they've made another prediction, and that's the prediction. Well. Guess what the real figures were when they checked them out? Who do you think was right? Well, that's interesting, right? Because now I have two questions. First of all, why don't we have any stage three? And why do they have a name for something that doesn't exist? What's going on here? How come we only have about 7,000 years worth of supernovas remnants out there. Is it possible? Maybe the universe is not billions of years old? Is that a possibility? Well, it looks like these scientists have noticed the problem. One of them is asking, where are they all? Well, maybe the Bible is right, and maybe the theory is not right. Maybe we should find another theory. Maybe the read should read the Bible and do what it says. We just looked at the stars. We're moving on nicely that the, the world shows through stars that it's young. We're going to now look at organic life. What evidence do we have in organic life that tells us that the world is young? Let's look at this. I love this one. The mitochondrial DNA is the powerhouse for a cell. That's right. It takes the food you take, this little spot inside your cell, and converts it into energy. This is really clever. This power generator, it's actually a power generator. It's an incredible power generator. But guess what? It's inherited from the mother. You cannot get this power from the father. You can get this power only from the mother. What a surprise. The father doesn't have the power. It turned out that the mitochondrial DNA mutation rates show that we have a common ancestor about 300 generations ago at 20 years per generation. So they discovered that this DNA will have a common ancestor. And guess what they called this common ancestor? They called it Mitochondrial Eve. Now, okay, look, there's nothing clever about the name. They gave it Mitochondrial Eve. What is really interesting is that they're using those figures and numbers. They worked out the generation when this Mitochondrial Eve lived. And guess what the year was that they came out? How many years ago? It came out exactly 6,500 years ago. When I say exactly, I'm sure there's a room for a little margin there. 6,500 years. And do you know why they don't announce this very loudly? because it contradicts the theory. That's not science. That's religion. 
It could have saved them a lot of calculation, really, if they just read the Bible. It would have just given them that date, and they would have been uh, just as wise. Let's do one more, and then we'll go on to the next one. The Great Barrier Reef in Australia is the largest coral reef in the world. It's considered one of the seven wonders of the underwater world. It's incredible. Even, uh, even though the reef um, is considered the rainforest of the ocean, they are, in fact, made of animals. What you're looking at, at that is animals. It's not plants. And the beautiful colors you're seeing up there is actually algae. What it is is that they have a symbiotic relationship. Algae, and that means symbiotic means that they rely on each other to live. There is three times as much algae as there is animal tissue. They used to think that it took millions of years to grow these things until they found this, a shoe with a wad of coral attached to it. They found this in the waters of the Philippines in 1992, and now because of this finding and other calculations they made and recalculated, they came up with a new age for coral reef. And guess how, old ago, how long ago it is? 3,700 years old. You see, that all makes sense. If the Bible is right, this is what happened. God created the world approximately 6,000 years ago. 4,400 years ago, there was this amazing global flood that buried and destroyed everything. And soon after that, things started to grow again. That makes perfect sense. That works. We just looked at organic evolution, and now we want to see evidence on macroevolution. What evidence do we have in macroevolution? You see, macroevolution is the idea that life evolved from simple to complex organism. Bottom simple, top complicated. These fossils you see in the layers, that represents the evolution of life. They say that, um, they say that this is representative of millions of years. Here's the problem. If we can show that these layers were not billions, or, sorry, millions of years old, well, that removes all the theory, puts the theory upside down, doesn't it? So here, let's have a look at this. Sometimes, when they drill into the ground, they get oil. They hit the ground and they hit oil. The oil is under a great deal of pressure. In some places, about 20,000 pounds per square inch. That is so high, as soon as they hit it, it blows sky high. Immediately, as soon as they do that. Now here, this expert who studied the rocks puts a limit on this pressure. It says, even though the weight of the rock is supplying the pressure, the pressure in the well is greater than the weight of overburden, is what they say. They say that the rock should have cracked and leaked off, guess how long ago? Within less than 10,000 years. Well, that's interesting. But wait, I hear you say this. I thought it takes millions of years to make oil in the first place. Well, let's have a look at that. It turns out you can make oil within 20 minutes. They've done it in 1971 in the laboratory. They've got a plant that changes sewage sludge to oil in 30 minutes. Don't, tell, don't let them tell you that it takes millions of years to make oil. It can be done in just a few minutes. There's a factory in Texas that takes turkey guts, pressurizes the heats, and heats them, and turns them into oil. They say in this article, we duplicate what Mother Nature does, but what Mother Nature took millions of years to do, we do in about 30 minutes. I have a question. How do they know it took millions of years to do it, if they can do it in 20 minutes? You see, I think it makes much more sense to believe what the Bible says. God created the world in 6,000 years, Approximately 4,400 years ago, there was a great flood. It buried all animals and all plants instantly, and oil happened shortly after that event. That works for me. Now, I want you to think about this. If that's really what happened, then every time you fill your car with fuel, which comes from oil, should remind us of God's judgment on earth and how God hates sin because the global flood was as a result of God's punishment on earth. And that's why we have oil today. And as we filled up our cars to come here today, it should have reminded us of God's judgment and hate of sin. If these layers represent millions of years, then why do we find modern artifacts in them, like this bell? It was found inside a lump of coal in 1943-44 in West Virginia. It was supposed to be about 300 million years old. They found this, uh, th that it was made from an unusual mix of metal, which is different from any known modern alloy uh, 
production we have today. It's obviously not millions of years old, right? Well, it was probably buried quickly during the global flood 4,400 years ago. This vessel made of zinc and silver we found in solid rock in America and was supposed to be 600 million years old. It's obviously not billions of years old. It was probably buried during the global flood round about when? 4,400 years ago. A 10-inch long gold chain was found in a lump of coal in Illinois. It was obviously, it's obviously not billions of years old. You can see that. Well, it probably got buried very recently, about 4,400 years ago during the global flood. They call these findings, believe it or not, out of place artifacts, and they are found absolutely everywhere. In fact, they are so common, they have a name for it. They call it oop arts. Out of place artifacts. If you want more about this information, you can get it from these books over here. There at the back, you can have a look at them if you like. And uh, this, these books are full of this information. If I stood here and I took you through every one of them, it would have taken a long time. I finished with the microevolution. We're going to now move on to evidence, which is in microevolution. I'm going to take you through that very quickly. Microevolution is what we, uh, what we uh, observe, this is what we really do find. This is testable observable science. This is where we see dogs producing dogs, cats producing cats, things that is absolute fact that we see happen before us. But you see, Darwin did not believe this. He came up with this uh, tree of life uh, idea in 1859, which he claimed that they were all related. You need to see what he's saying. He's saying that not only animals are related to animals, he's saying that animals are related to plants. Does that mean my ancestor was a cabbage? That's what it's saying, isn't it? But you know, they found this notebook, which was believed in 1837. You notice something very interesting. I want you to look at this very carefully. There's something very interesting on that drawing that people don't see. And here's it is. It was not a scientific theory. It was actually something he thought, he hoped. And he wrote it on his notebook, I think. Today is the greatest scientist of all, he thought. It turned out he was wrong, bless him. The Guardian said in 2009, Charles Darwin was wrong about the tree of life. He was wrong about it. In Telegraph it said Charles Darwin's tree of life is wrong and misleading. But they still teach it in books. They still teach it in museums. They still teach it in, they show it on TVs. If you go to a park, you go to a park these days, what do you see? They see this all over the place. Why are they teaching our kids this? Now, here's the thing. If, if this is true, then the appearance of fossils happened around about 570 million years ago, and we, ob we evolved to where we are today. Okay, so things started way below down there in the chart, and we become what we are today. If that's true, then how come bats that are supposed to be over 52 million years ago old are still the same today? I thought these things change. How come this lobster hasn't changed for 110 million years? According to National Geographic, we could call them living fossils since they have had a consistent morphologic, uh, morphologic pattern throughout many millions of years. I'll translate that. It said it hasn't changed for millions of years. How come horseshoe crab is supposed to be half a billion years old? It turned out it has not much, changed much other than today's horseshoe crab apparently is a little bigger. And then they admitted, well, that might be because we found a small one. You can do, <laughs> you can do good science with that. <laughs> I mean, you know, good observation, good on them. This is my favorite, a fossilized jellyfish. This is what this article said. This, these ancient jellyfish showed the same complexity as modern jellyfish. Wait a minute. So it didn't start from simple to complex. It was complex to start with. Is that what it's saying? I've got one more question. Did you know that these things are about 97% water? How long would it last before it dissolves if it was sitting around? Hours, maybe days? Well, they tell us these things were buried over millions of years. Well, how come we got a jellyfish fossil? It just doesn't make sense. Wait, I think it's probably because God created the world 6,000 years ago. And 4,400 years ago, there was this great big flood that covered everything very quickly, and it fossilized. So the layers don't represent an old age. It can't be billions of years old. 
There are so many other examples I can show you. Look, I had all of those prepared for you. You would have loved me to take you through each one of those one by one. So I decided just to show you very quickly, and I'm not kidding you, you can find much more information. There are many good books about this, and these are the websites, in case you're interested, you can go through it and see it for yourself. It's absolutely full of them. Now here's the question, do you think that changes the mind of an evolutionist who's got a one mind track? Do you think it makes any difference whatsoever? No, do you know why? Because evolution is not science, it's blind faith. It is completely blind faith. Now, if the world was billions of years old, how come the first developed writing appeared only about 5,000 years ago? How come the oldest language that can reasonably be reconstructed is already modern, sophisticated, and complete? In fact, it turns out that the so-called primitive languages are actually more complicated. Wait a minute, they're actually more complicated? That means they're on, not only recent, but they used to be cleverer? Well, that's quite remarkable. If the Earth is 4.6 billion years old, then how is the year 2000 on the Chinese calendar about 4,700 years? They think they started the calendar with Noah's flood. In fact, they call Noah Fuhai. How come the Hebrew calendar for year 2000 is 5,760? If it wasn't for the rabbi completely messing up the calendar by about 164 years in order to mess up the prophecy for Jesus, year 2000 would be today 5,924. Maybe day one of Hebrew's calendar started when God created Adam. Isn't that a bit of a coincidence? You know what? I think it's probably because 6,000 years ago, God created everything. 4,400 years ago, there was a great big flood. And you know what? If the Bible is right about these things, it might be right about other things it says as well. I think we ought to read it. Find out what God wants and do it. The evidence for a young earth is absolutely overwhelming. Not just a young earth, a young universe is completely overwhelming. I couldn't bring out all the material. I had to condense this so much. Again, it took me longer to condense it than to prepare it. It was incredible. I've got a lot of hidden slides that didn't pop up for you. It all, not, none of those things um, show an old earth. Here's the question, why do they, don't they show our students and our uh, young children those facts? Why don't they show them that? They only show them evidence for an old earth. Remember the example I gave you earlier? They ignore the young dates. They're ignoring the limiting factor here, aren't they? They're ignoring the young dates, focusing on the old ones, and ignoring the limiting factors. There are hundreds of physical processes that the majority give us young dates. Today, we only lo just looked at a few, uh, just a few of them. Just to finish off with, just want to uh, point out, you, you know, our science books are actually full of evolution these days. It's not about science anymore. It's just full of evolution. Our kids are losing their faith, not because of science. They're losing their faith to another religion. That's all that's happening here. This process, this professor of, of physics at the University of Manchester said, in fact, evolution became, in a sense, a scientific religion. Almost all scientists have accepted it, and many are prepared to bend their observations to fit with it. 75% of our kids lose their faith. We're talking about kids who are brought up in a Christian family, lose their faith within the first year of college. Actually, the figures are a lot worse now. It's actually gone up to 88%. The majority of our kids who go to college will lose their faith even though they're brought up in a Christian environment, Christian teaching within the first year. So many people are losing their faith because of religion. This is completely and totally unnecessary. I'm going to give you one story and then we're all finished. I just want to ask you a quick question. Does anybody know here who Charles Templeton is? Okay, fantastic. A lot of you do. Good. He used to be a prominent young evangelist and a pastor in the early 1940s. He worked very closely with Billy Graham. In fact, Billy Graham called him his best buddy. He's one of his closest friends. He became one of the three vice presidents of newly formed Youth of Christ International Organization in 1945. He was an incredible character. He was listed among those best used of God by National Association of Evangelicals in one of his campaigns in Evansville, Indiana, over a two-week period, 91,000 people attended within a two-week period. The population is 128,000 in that area. How incredible. People were being saved daily. This guy was an incredible tool. God was using him in a fantastic way. In 1948, something lovely happened. 
they decided to send him to Princeton Theological Seminary to get formal education. They thought, you know, he's doing all these things, let's get some education into him. Charles Templeton was already having problems with millions of years. With the ideas of millions of years and how it conflicted with the Bible, when he went to the Princeton College, he found that they had already adopted the idea. They adopted the idea of millions of years. Charles Templeton completely rejected Genesis' account of creation by influence of these two guys, and he became an evolutionist. Charles Templeton told Billy Graham these very sad words. He said, but Billy, it's simply not possible any longer to believe, for instance, the biblical account of creation. The world wasn't created over a period of days a few thousand years ago. It, was, it has evolved over millions of years. It shook the roots of Billy Graham's faith. Even he started to question whether the Bible is completely true. He later said, whether man evolved or not, and whether God took his man, this man, and give it a soul or not, does not matter. God still created man. See what happened there? He completely questioned the Bible. He's now, ask, he's now questioning whether God gave his soul to man or not, to start with. And he's saying, it doesn't matter. That would not, as far as the Bible is concerned, that would not be the God of my Bible. Sadly, even Billy Graham later on adopted the idea of evolution into the Bible. Charles Templeton, Templeton later wrote a book called Farewell to God and wrote, I believe that there is no supreme being with human attributes, no God in the biblical sense, but that all life is a result of timeless evolutionary processes over millions of years. You see, Charles Templeton was brainwashed with a lie of millions of years, and it affected how he thought. At least he was consistent with his belief and where the Bible stands. You see, it's very easy to brainwash you. It's incredibly easy to brainwash people. This is how easy it is. In the first year of school, a child will be given a book like this, aimed at their age, five years plus, and it says these things. The introduction says, dinosaurs lived 250 million years ago. The first page says, life first appeared on Earth about 3.8 billion years ago. The second page promotes how they evolved to have legs instead of fins without any evidence whatsoever against the knowledge of science we know today. Why are we allowing our children to be brainwashed by such a lie? It's not even true. It's a lie. It's unscientific. The rest of the book is no better, unfortunately. After finishing brainwashing them with old ages of millions of years, they move on to evolution of man. What does dinosaur have to do with evolution anyway? Tell them about dinosaurs. Why tell them about the evolution of anything? How many kids today in this town are being taught this lie this week? I'm going to say all of them. Is that right? But did you know that that's calling Jesus a liar? Jesus says the creation of Adam was the beginning. You see, somebody is wrong here. They can't both be right. One of them is wrong. Colossians 2.8 says, Be aware that no man cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of man, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. I want you to think about this. We're going to finish off in just a few seconds. After 12 or 16 years in school, how are they going to view the world? Are they going to view it through Christ's eyes, or are they going to view it through evolutionary eyes? Science was supposed to be pursuit of truth, and the Bible says Jesus is the truth. So if Jesus is the truth, then there must be no conflict between the Bible and science. There can be no conflict. And it just turns out, guess what? There is no conflict between science and the Bible. The conflict actually is between evolution and science. But we've been conditioned and brainwashed to think otherwise. The world is young after all. Now, here's the thing. It's probably right about other things as well. You see, maybe God did make the whole world. He made the world. He made the rules. We broke it. We are guilty. We deserve punishment. We deserve eternal punishment in hell unless we can find somebody to pay for our punishment. And I want to thank God for sending Jesus so that he can take my place so that I don't have to be punished. And what I want to do is um, just remind you, the world is young, God's word is reliable, dependable, and we can live by it. 
Now, I would love to come back one day and talk to you about the other bits and pieces we spoke about. We spoke, uh, I'd like to talk about how come we can see stars billions of light years away in a very young universe. How can that happen? And I would like to talk about radiometric dating. I'm sure you'll all be excited to hear that. And I would like to talk about the science of the six-day creation and how we also know that Genesis is not a myth. How do we actually know that, that it's not a myth? And we can trust God's word for it, but is there any scientific evidence that is not a myth? I'd love to do that. And for now, I want to thank you for your patience. I want to thank you for listening to me. I hope you had a good time like I did. God bless you, and we'll see you soon. Thank you very much.